The emergence of COVID-19 has forced the legal industry to rapidly undergo a fundamental transformation. I'm Jack Newton, CEO and co-founder of Clio, the world's leading cloud-based legal software provider. In each episode of Daily Matters, we'll explore what this new normal means for law firms, how legal professionals can find success while working remotely, and how lawyers can best serve their clients during this unprecedented situation. On today's show, we welcome Chris Bentley, Managing Director of the Legal Innovation Zone, the world's first legal tech incubator. Chris, it's great to have you here. Great to be with you, Jack. So, Chris, first and foremost, how are you and your family doing? Uh, so far, my family and I are well. Uh, the extended family is well, too. Got our fingers crossed, and we're doing what we're supposed to be doing at this point, social distancing. That, that's great. And uh, t- tell me about what's, what's on your mind right now. Uh, how are, what, what's top of mind for you? How do things look in, uh, in Ontario more broadly? Well, in Ontario, uh, things are, we haven't hit the peak yet. Uh, top of mind is uh, just what you asked about, uh, health of family, friends, um, concern for them. Um, We are watching what's going on on a broader basis, but the focus really is about our family, our friends, uh, uh, to uh, mother, mother mother-in-law who are quite elderly, doing very well, but quite elderly. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're watching that, I suspect, like everybody else. That's good. And tell us a little bit more about some of the personal impacts you've seen from from COVID-19. Well, the, I mean, the, the most significant personal impact is the social distancing, remain at home most of the time. Um, all of the different uh, changes we have to make when we do the ordinary life's tasks, like going to the grocery store. Uh, that's become quite a, quite a concern where it never was before. Um, you know, not able to get together with family, uh, with friends. Um, that's, uh, that's a significant impact. Fortunately for me, uh, the work impact has really meant that I work from home. And mm-hmm. since I live in London, Ontario, and I work most of the time in Toronto, Ontario, it's, you know, it's a small pleasure to be able to spend time with my wife <laughs> during the week instead of being in Toronto. But I've been fortunate in the sense that the work has not been impacted uh, significantly at this point in time. That's great. And, and a great segue uh, into learning a bit more about the legal innovation zone. So I'd love for you to tell uh, my listeners, what is the legal innovation zone? And I do think it's, uh, uh, not to abuse the term, but a, a pretty innovative thing. Well, you know, I, I spent, uh, so 23 years as a practicing lawyer, 10 years in government, four years as attorney general, and I came to Ryerson University to help set up a licensing program for the Law Society of Ontario. And while I was doing that, uh, Ryerson had developed an international reputation in supporting entrepreneurs. They had an entrepreneurial zone, which supported at the time about 80 companies. And I walked out while I was setting up the licensing program and and asked the executive director of this uh, entrepreneurial area, well, how many of these startups are doing something in law? And at the time she said none. And And so Chris, sorry to interrupt this incubator or, or this entrepreneurial zone was was like an incubator or, or were, yeah, were these a, students working on projects or recently graduated students working on startups or spinoffs from the university? Tell us a little bit more about that, yeah, that specific a, program. It was a legal tech incubator with all mm-hmm. different areas of service. Uh, it, it's been acknowledged, it's called the DMZ, been acknowledged as the number one business incubator university-based in the world. Uh, it's achieved that um, both alone and together with others. Uh, so it has established quite a bit of a reputation. Um, yeah. And they were supporting these uh, companies at the time from idea through concept through sales. And so I asked the executive director, how many of these 80 companies doing all different things yeah. uh, were doing anything in law? And she said none. And so the same day I emailed the president, we had a chat. Uh, and uh, Sheldon Levy is his name. And I said, look, Sheldon, we need a legal innovation zone. And he said, what's that? And I, you know, I'm sure you've never had this experience, Jack, but from time to time you get asked a question, you have no idea what the answer (laughs) is. So I sort of said, and he said, that's great. Well, you go ahead and do that. And so we did. And and, uh, I uh, contacted a 
a friend of mine who I'd worked with in government by the name of Hirsch Perlis. And uh, he came on a, a few months later. And then six months after he came on, we set up the world's first tech incubator dedicated to legal. There are other incubators, many others, that have done some legal as well as other things, but we were the first, I believe, to do uh, legal only. And we really had three goals at the time. First, to support startups, take them from idea through concept, through sales development. Uh, the second was to support organizations that wanted to advance their innovation agenda in law. And the third was cheekily, very cheekily, to help design a 21st century justice system. And we mm -hmm. put this all under the rubric of building better legal solutions for consumers. So that's what we're all about. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And well, how what is you the, do. It, it, it is what we do. Um, and and you, were, you were kind enough to invite me to speak uh, to the Legal Innovation Zone audience uh, that, that feels like it was maybe a couple years ago. Um, and that's right. uh, it was... Uh, it was great and and so great to see all that energy around creating innovations in legal. And speaking more about innovation, I'm, I'm curious to see what have you seen shift around what has been an industry-wide discussion for years around how do we drive innovation in legal? And uh, I, I think it's interesting in this crisis where despite there having been, been so much talk and not a lot of action around innovating, it feels like this crisis is, is finally driving some innovation out of, out of necessity. And I'm curious to see what your perspective on that is, Chris. What, what, are you, what have you seen shift around the discussions around legal innovation as a result of COVID-19? Well, let me start before the crisis, before COVID-19. Uh, there was a... <laughs> There was a development of the discussion. There was more and more action and more and more interest. We've always thought that if you build better legal solutions for consumers, it's good for professionals as well. Because as you know, a lot of, a lot of people in businesses don't go to lawyers uh, for their uh, legal issues because they can't afford it. And the work that you've done uh, with Clio is to make things easier, faster, simpler for lawyers so they can better serve clients. There's a huge market out there if more and more people would adopt an innovative approach. Yeah. Um, and that's the, uh, that's the position we took from the beginning. So it was in the lawyer's self-interest to be innovative. But, you know, that, that was a developing discussion. Gosh, it's hard. It's hard miles. Hard miles. Uh, and, and then the crisis hits, and all of a sudden, all of the things that we were told could never happen in the courts are starting to happen. Oh, you're, you're going to have a conference call instead of an in-person attendance. You're, you're going to have a Zoom meeting, that unheard of. You're going to work remotely, and now we all have to use the cloud. I was saying to your colleagues earlier, I think the discussion about whether we can ever do things in the cloud again is done. I think it's over. I so you hope know? you're right, Chris. <laughs> I, I, it's just done because it's, it's pretty hard to social distance from your house, conduct business if you're not using the cloud. Yeah. So I think we're, we're done with that. Um, but I, you know, that's the short term. That's the short term discussion. Uh, and that sort of gets people from a standstill to moving a little bit. Mm hmm We've yet to see whether that will translate into the near the medium term discussion. How do we regularize business, uh, fully utilizing just the tech tools that are around today? And then how do we take it the next step, which you know you've talked about in your book, um, where we rethink the way many of us have practiced or practice uh, to to better meet the put the Put the client at the center mm -hmm. of the practice, better meet their needs, and uh, run our practice more effectively, make more money, uh, and serve more people. We've yet to see whether that's going to happen. And I would say that that discussion is going to be apart from a discussion about the courts. And I, I don't necessarily see the courts 
and the general practice of law running at the same speed on the discussion that involves adopting innovation. I think, I think private practice can run faster mm -hmm. and more creatively if it wants to than the courts have shown an interest in doing so far. It feels like I want to spend a minute speaking about the courts. It does feel like the courts are maybe reaching, they will reach a breaking point where if the crisis and the social distancing and, and the, the ban on, on large public gatherings continues for months, as I think many pundits think it, it will at this point, do you believe the courts will have a choice around adapting or will they, be, will they actually dig in their heels and, and not evolve or change in this crisis? Well, for several years, uh, we've been saying that um, the courts are already at a crisis point. They serve mm -hmm. relatively few uh, people, uh, yeah. particularly in family and civil. Less than 4% of cases ever go to trial. Most of what you do in court doesn't have to happen in court, as we are now seeing. Um, and and the, the better approach is a surprisingly simple one. You, you don't need to digitize everything. In fact, that would be a mistake. Just rethink it from the client or the consumer or the business out. What's their right. issue? What's their problem? Most of it never has to get to court. And even some of the leaders of the profession uh, have, have provided a step-by-step -step outline of how to do this, but the courts have been resistant. Uh, judiciary is independent, and, and that independence, I think, has been um, expanded into a power to say no to anything that smacks of change, and that's unfortunate. Uh, and I think it's hurting, it's been hurting the courts before COVID. It was hurting them before. People were going to private court, mm -hmm. mediation, arbitration, anybody who could take it outside the court was, and others who couldn't uh, simply didn't engage in the process. So their rights weren't being asserted. Now we've got COVID. So let's, where do we go with your question? Where, where are we if this lasts a few more months? They're going to have a massive backlog. Even the people who are able to go to court or were able before are not going to get a hearing for so much longer than it was already taking. I think they either change or shrink in significance and that would be that would not be a good outcome i would like there to be a strong court judiciary that has significant influence um, over the rights and responsibilities of society it might not be for everybody but i'd like to see a strong one i don't know where that's going to end up so maybe a final reflection on on the courts chris uh where, where do you think that resistance to change is rooted in the courts? And, and you know, where I, could we drive that change if we're to be optimistic? Where, where would that change, that catalyst have to come through? If it's not a, a global pandemic that almost forces every business uh, and institution to change how it does business, if it's not that, what could possibly drive that change? Well, I think, first of all, bluntly, they've They've used judicial independence simply to say no mm -hmm. to change that they didn't want to do. It's in their power to change it. In, in Ontario, in every Canadian jurisdiction, the rules, the process, the forms, the steps are decided by rules committees and the judges have the right to make the rules. So they could change that relatively simply. As I say, it's a mistake to apply technology to the existing process. That will never work. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to rethink, redesign the existing process, simplify it, um, get to the decision point faster. So it's within their power to do it. I think to be fair, um, those in charge of the courts do not necessarily have systems expertise and justice is a system. I mean, it is a system. Uh, they don't have obvious competition and competition tends to uh, spur innovation, get people moving mm -hmm. faster in different ways. But we're starting to see in your home province, um, British Columbia with the Civil Resolution Tribunal, we're starting to see an interest in other initiatives yeah. that can take business away from the courts. 
Yeah, that's and, probably a separate discussion, but the the work yeah. being done at the Civil Rights uh, Tribunal is is really, really incredible. It, it's it's very exciting. It is a separate discussion. So I, you know, I think a lack of expertise, maybe in terms of systems, uh, the right, the power to say no, uh, that's been exercised as a right, um, the refusal or failure of governments uh, and the profession uh, to demand better. It doesn't mean they can impose better, uh, but simply providing more judges, more money, more courthouses to a system that is not operating as it should is not helping the innovation discussion. And yeah. at, at some point, I think governments need to remember their responsibility is to all of the people and not just the professionals. And they need to take the action that will deliver uh, justice most effectively to the people. Yeah, fully agree. So, so Chris, shifting gears a, a little bit, um, I'm curious at a high level, how do you think law firms should be adapting to the changes that COVID-19 is, is bringing to bear? Well, I, um, I, I mean, at the moment, they're in crisis mode, I suspect, or close to it, just trying to set up to work remotely, contacting clients, many of whom have had their businesses or their own lives turned upside down by this, um, trying to, to establish a communication with the members of their own firm who are now all working remotely. It, it's different for most people, let's face it. And, it, and together with the health challenges, it, it imposes huge pressures. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think although all of your attention might be focused in the near term on that. I'd focus whatever you have to, but you've got to save some of your time and energy for different discussions. The second discussion, the, the medium term discussion is, where do you expect to be in six months time and how do you get there? How do you regularize this type of business operation to most effectively serve your clients if their businesses as they're coming out of the freeze, uh, if they're individuals as they're reestablishing their employment, uh, how, how, do you, how do you start to regularize that? I'm not saying this is always going to be the regular state of affair, affairs, but I think you've got to reserve some time every day, every week to think about that. And then I think the third thing you need to do is Where's the business opportunity for me if I do things differently? We've done it traditionally. I don't see it continuing in a traditional way um, after this. Consumers are much more savvy uh, now than they were a decade, two decades ago. They're used to doing things remotely. They're used to doing things online. They demand what you've always talked about, that consumer experience that's at the heart of things. I think, I, I hope that lawyers and firms will start focusing some of their important time on those things, on the future, and, and start doing whatever training is required, whatever rethinking is required, at least start it now and better position them for success in the future. I mean, look, we're a smart profession. We're smart people. We're yep. very capable people. One of the one of the things that's happened over the years is we've put lawyers in a straitjacket. We, we said, you have, to, you have to walk a very narrow line. You can't use all of the knowledge you have. It's not just law. It's, we have business connections. We have technology connections. We have knowledge outside. Uh, we have friends and, and people outside that we should be accessing. You know, we can't get them to invest in our businesses. We can't set up a business with them. These are ancient rules. If they ever made sense, they don't anymore. Lawyers should be allowed to compete because, goodness gracious, the ones who are competing with lawyers don't have the same restrictions. They're just going right. at it hard. We yeah. should let lawyers, free, we should free the lawyers to compete. And maybe this translates nicely to the, to the next question. If, if you anticipate a future where lawyers uh, do get more open-minded and, and, and maybe less confined in the way that they feel that they, they need to run their, 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 their law firm and their business. Um, and it feels like the COVID-19 crisis is actually creating some of that flexibility, almost permission to experiment in this 
in this time of great uncertainty, right? And I think there's a lot of, you, you talked about even a client-centered approach. If there's ever a time to tear off a new sheet of paper on your brainstorming sketch pad and start from scratch, now's the time because the, the world's a new place. And I think what we see in this crisis is um, an opportunity to invent and an opportunity to do things that we might not have had permission to do, might not have, might have been petrified of trying, you know, in, in a stable, normal environment. And all of a sudden, all bets are off and, and you can actually undertake some of that experimentation. Um, and what I'm curious to hear your perspective on is if you think about the, the various experiments that we're seeing at scale, actually, it's almost like every law firm got sent home to experiment with a new way of practicing law. So we've got a million lawyers in North America uh, and, and, and millions more worldwide undertaking this, this grand experiment. What do you think the long-term impacts will, will be? You know, I, I think we're going to see, and I'd love to comment on what you think the short-term impacts will be and what the short-term changes will be. But when we think about the long-term impacts and the ones that will endure beyond this media crisis, what, what do you think those will be? Will, will this crisis have lasting changes on the profession? And what do you think those changes will be? I think it's uh, going to have lasting changes on the people and businesses that we serve. Um, it, we, uh, they were already demanding a uh, legal services that were faster, simpler, and more affordable. I think this will accelerate that. Uh, they're not going to come out particularly interested in paying, you know, uh, hundreds of dollars an hour for an endless series of hours for services that they want immediately uh, at a fixed price. I think they are uh, going to be much less forgiving of delays uh, and much, much more focused on what they want, when they want it, and how they want it. And mm -hmm. I think that consumer, the client, the customer, that will start accelerating the change that it started in law, but that's, that it's moving rapidly outside of law. So I think that's, that's number one. Um, I think number two, a lot of lawyers have been given a wake-up call. Now, those who are closer to retirement, maybe they're not going to answer the call, but they don't have to. Uh, the people who I, I really feel for at the moment are the ones who are finishing school or they're in their first number of years of practice, you know, zero to 10. They've invested so much time, so much energy, so much money into a future. And now they're sitting back wondering whether they've got a future. Yeah. Uh, and and I would say to them, you've got a future, but you have to use all of your talents and all of your skills. And you should demand of those who lead you within the profession or outside. You should demand the right to live your future and not simply somebody else's past. You should demand the right to use all of your skills, all of your connections, all of your knowledge. And that transcends different professions, that transcends different people's skills. Uh, it, they, are, they are a generation that has grown up with change, accelerating change. It's grown up with technology, uh, which is in love with technology. Uh, this all comes naturally. And, and I think we need to unleash that creativity. And we need to say to them, look, this is your time. You, you can be the leaders of the profession. You don't have the years or decades of experience in law, but, but you know as much or more about technology and change as any of the senior partners. Get in there, use the skills, don't be afraid. This is your time and this is your area of expertise. I love it. Um, that's a, a heartening message uh, amidst a, a global pandemic, Chris. Thank you for that. Um, and, you know, maybe moving on to another, uh, you know, visionary and, and aspirational topic. One of the legal innovation zone's main goals is to design a 21st century justice system. And I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, that's accomplished by driving technological and systematic change in the legal field. Uh, and I'm curious to hear from you, what does that 21st century justice system look like? And does your view of what that look like, or I'm sorry, does your view of what that would look like change based on the current crisis? Well, in many ways, it's 
it's a simple view. It begins with the person with the problem. And I think over the centuries, uh, literally the centuries, we focused on the courts. We focused on the professional, we focused on the judge, and we focused on the court. That's not where it starts. It starts with people or businesses and their problems, uh, whether they're disputes, whether they're trying to, to do something, uh, figure out what information do they need? What legal expertise do they need? And how quickly can you get to a resolution that is fair and just? And I think if you design it from people out, you start with information, you connect them with the legal or other resources they need, you triage, so you can, you can tell them the right routes to achieve what they want, or you can tell them directly, you know what, you're not getting to get that. You're not allowed to have that. Don't be afraid to triage. It happens in hospitals, thank goodness, but don't be afraid to triage. Uh, and then you find them the easiest, fastest, simplest resolution possible. And what ends up in our court system should be the cases that really require the time, the attention, and the expertise of our great judges. And I think if you start redesigning it from that approach, which is a very simple one, then you apply technology to the new, to the simplified design to accelerate things, to expand their reach. Gosh, you could, in a very short time, beginning with no extra money, you could create a truly 21st century model of justice. It, it's not hard. It, it would not be hard. And it's, yeah, it's so interesting. I, I was just going to comment that you're, you're describing a client centered justice system. That's what it's about, isn't it? It's, it's all about the client. You and should write putting, a book. Uh, I think somebody else just did that, and it's a good book, by the way. I really enjoy that. In thank fact, you wrote it. Thank you. Thank you. But uh, I, I don't you know, really talk about the justice system as a whole. I talked about the client-centered law firm, and it's amazing the parallels, just as you were articulating what the 21st century justice system looks like. It's, it's a macro view of what the 21st century law firm looks like. And instead of being about the, the courts and the judge, be about the people with the problems and, and, and work from there figure out their journey, figure out how you solve their problems. And, and they should run together because at the end of the day, what the court is supposed to be doing is resolving problems that people and businesses have uh, that can't be resolved through some other means. That's what they're doing. So that the people, the businesses are at the center of things. Uh, and, and where we've got to, unfortunately, with our justice system is far too much concentration on process, not people far too much concentration on the professionals, not what the people need first. Uh, and, and I think if we just change the focus, change mm -hmm. the focus and put the people at the middle, put the people in the center, you're gonna get a much better approach. That's a 21st century approach. You know, whether it uses a particular type of technology or other, whether it uses AI or not AI, that, that's not the issue. The issue is put the people and the businesses in the middle, focus on them, the rest will be uh, pretty simple to figure out. And, and Chris, it may be the, the case that it doesn't, but does, does this current crisis change or pivot your view of what that 21st century justice system needs to look like? Or does it just underscore the, the need for that system today? I think it underscores the need for significant change. I think it eliminates a lot of the reasons we couldn't do anything. I, I think it just has laid bare all these silly reasons that, you, you know, you, you can't have a video hearing. Well, why not? We just did. You can't yeah. have a, a video, you know, you can't have a telephone conference. Well, why not? We just did. You can't have a judge in one jurisdiction and a, and, and a litigants in other jurisdictions and a client in other jurisdictions. Well, guess what? We just did. Uh, you can't email documents. Well, guess what? We just did. You can't use <laughs> right. cloud, cloud storage. Well, guess what? We already have been. And the rest of the world uses cloud storage. We, we've, we've developed this idea that we have to be perfect, but perfect only exists in theory. And so we're increasingly serving the theoretical consumer and not the real consumer. We need a justice system that actually works for this society and 
serves the people in this society, the people and businesses in this society. I don't think it's particularly hard. And I think this crisis, as terrible as it is, which brought most court systems to a halt for a period of time, has shown how far behind they really are, has made that obvious. And when, the, when all the attention on the necessary and important attention on people's safety, their jobs, their families, when that lessens a little bit, I think there'll be a very direct focus on justice and what it can't do. Because at the end of the day, as we rebuild the economy, you cannot build a 21st century justice system on a mid 20th century legal platform. You cannot do that. And that's what governments have been trying to do. And I think as governments figure out how to get people back to work, how to how to get an economy rolling in a, in a real way that generates wealth in the future, they're going to need a legal platform that is responsive in real time, not in some time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think your comment around, uh, you didn't, I'm paraphrasing, but your comment around, you know, good today is better than perfect tomorrow. Uh, when you're looking at the trade-offs we're making in the current justice system, even if you if you grade it as being perfect, it's it's doing perfect justice delivery for such a vanishingly small portion of people that need it. We're not making the right trade off. We need we need to skew towards embracing some of these uh, newer technologies uh, that just let us move faster and and yeah. increase access to to justice. Yeah, open it up, make it more transparent, move faster in real time. And I think you know so many of my legal colleagues would jump at the chance of doing this. They want to do this. Uh, and I think one of the side, we, we talked about, you know, how are people going to be in law going to be spending their time in the near term or the medium term? I already hear from a number of colleagues who are out there thinking, well, you know, here I am at my house and I've got to conduct these transactions, but there's a better way of doing this. And, right. and how about this, Chris? What do you think of this? And, and we say, hey, what an interesting idea. I'll put you in touch with so-and-so and, and follow up. And, and they're thinking of innovative new ways of doing what we used to have to do with physical exchanges of paper and physical presence. Yeah, well, it's great. And, and great to see this, this change of place and, and change of environment, maybe catalyzing you know, some of these innovative uh, thoughts happening for, for so many lawyers out there. Yeah. Uh, well, Chris, this has been a wonderful conversation. I, I wonder if to close out, you might be able to leave our listeners with a message, speaking to them either as legal professionals or, or just as human beings that you'd like to leave as a parting note. Well, certainly to all of uh, the listeners, uh, please uh, be safe, stay healthy. Thoughts are with your family and friends. Uh, to those who are experiencing the uh, terrible economic times that this has brought about. Um, look, it's uh, it's very difficult. Um, and I know that you, Jack, so many of us uh, are going to be trying to try and be there to help. Uh, and I would say, as you look into the future, it took a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of hard work on your part, the part of your listeners, uh, to get to where you are. That same hard work and drive and determination will enable you to succeed in the future. Open yourselves up to the possibilities that are out there. Uh, don't be governed by the restrictions of the past. <clears throat> if you're true to yourself and your own and have confidence in yourself, you're going to succeed. It'll be an interesting and challenging journey for many, but you will succeed. That's a great note to, to end on. And uh, thanks so much for joining us today, Chris. Enormously valuable conversation. Thank you very much, Jack. Take care. Thanks for joining us on Daily Matters today, a podcast from Clio. Rate and review wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Daily Matters is produced by Andrew Booth, Sam Rosenthal, and Derek Bolin, and hosted by yours truly, Jack Newton. Thanks also to Clio, the world's leading cloud-based legal technology provider for supporting this podcast. If you'd like to learn more about Clio, please visit clio.com. 